Hello, Fearless Gamers, and welcome to another Fearless Games podcast. This is the Stark Lord, and with me today are... Matt the Vet. Matt the Clown. Yeah, the Wild Heart. And another rare... It's been a while since we've had all four of us here. Yes, it has. It has. How's it been going for everybody? It's been good. Eh. Okay. Got a, got a new airbrush, so I'm excited about that. Very nice, very nice. I got a new plague, so I'll be coughing the entire podcast. I'm excited about that. <laughs> it's an it's an internet plague, so all you guys listening are now infected. Yes, indeed. It's like some kind of biological internet virus. We're calling it Skynet. I was going to call it Megabyte. <laughs> no, that works too. Or hexadecimal. Give it, give it 20 years and this will actually be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Somehow they'll find a way to make viruses into computer viruses. It'll be wonderful. It, it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> it's, it's the wave of the future. Viruses yeah. traveling through the internet. Yep. And the future is now to get, get <laughs> shot. So then you're all infected. Deal with it. Oh no, it's a good thing I'm not on my computer. Oh, someone's gonna be mad at you. Nah, I just won't tell her. Is that like, like... Is that like a new form of STD then? If you're like your computer, you're using someone else's computer and you get a virus to it that way. I mean, what would you call that? What? It's like a socially <laughs> transmitted disease. I would say yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I would go with that. Okay, so let's actually talk about something intelligent. And I actually yeah. um, have a couple of rumors that have just been <laughs> popped out. Give oh, your rumors, yo. Um, uh, I, I figured I'd go with the rumors first before we go on to probably the the hot topic of of the week. Well, before um, your rumors, a simple yes or no will suffice. From the Dragon Twenty Two, have any of us seen the Dreamforge games models? Uh, no. yes. Though I don't I have anything about them. I'm going to look them up right now. Dreamforge games. They look nice. Uh, the Dragon Twenty Two with a zero for the O on Dragon. Uh. I've seen I've seen Dreamforge's game slash models. I don't oh, know much about yeah. like their own stuff, but they have some pretty cool looking things. To be honest, yeah, let's put, a, put a link in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the discussion Do so I can right see now. this. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, see. they make this uh, one of the earlier Titan things, right? No, it's for their own models, but it works perfectly as a knight. Yeah, it's it's a really mm. cool model. People like it. Uh, I've seen them before. Dreamforge makes some cool stuff. They should make a game. Do they make a game? They probably make a game. I don't know. I think they have a game in the works or something. I'm not 100% sure because they have their own little infantry. Yeah, I'm seeing that. This is the first time I've looked at their stuff in about a year, to be honest, since they released their first two really big models, and I'm seeing some pretty cool stormtroopers here. Yeah, they kind of look like a mix between Jinro and Imperial Guard. And like Imperial Jinro. Star Wars. I mean, look at the face on this thing. That's a well, that's where I got the Jinro from. Haven't you ever watched Jinro? Yeah, but it's, doesn't, it's got the Stormtrooper face, not the Jinro face. I love the Jinro it's got the, it's, No, this one that I'm looking at has the Jinro face. I disagree. We're going to fight about the Wolf Brigade all night now. Good looking yes, at we are. Different dude. Yeah, uh, we're looking at two different dudes. Okay. <laughs> but the one I'm looking at has a Jinro face. The one I'm looking at it clearly has a Stormtrooper face. The point the is, they look nice. They, they have they good really stuff. Nice. Yes. I can see a lot of people possibly using these for, like, Imperial Guard units, which oh, I wouldn't already, blame them. There's already um, that going on, I think. I've seen other pictures. Of, I don't know how they come, but I've seen pictures of those heads on Space Marine bodies, so... Mm. That would be a good I, so, but yes, it, they look interesting, and I can see like their Leviathan thing being a supplement for a knight if you want to do a Sakari a Sakarium force. I thought the thing was about the oh, size oh. of a. Their original was about the size of a, a warhound, isn't it? Uh, this well, the knight is fluff-wise, the knight is a bunch is pretty small, uh, like half the size of a warhound. This thing, I it's think, like they, I think the gray knight um knight is supposed to be the, no, the size of one. Yeah, you think that's got, too small it's for a one person. It's like an actual cockpit. Oh, okay. For one person. Oh, yeah, that is true. That is um, true. But I always, for some odd reason, I I thought of the Dread Knight when I kept seeing it. Well, the Dread Knight's like a baby knight. Yeah. <laughs> well, this funny. one is um eight and a half inches yeah, tall. Yeah, this is pretty big. Okay, that that not that long. could be a knight. That could be a yeah. Skatari knight. Okay. It's, and the thing is, it's got <laughs> the shoulders. It's got if you did some work to it, you could definitely pull off. A knight, if you wanted to run a knight in a Skatari type of thing, but it's just they're very much making it their own. So, 
Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a nice looking neo fascist sci fi stormtrooper and giant robots. Well, mm-hmm. Giant robot knight golem thing, Bob. Yeah, one of which has a scythe arm. Always a good option for giant robots. Giant blades make perfect sense, right? You gotta somehow. harvest your wheat somehow. It's true. That's clearly a th- farming bot. A space <laughs> farming, farming bot. Farming bot. I have come to reap your wheat. And maybe your souls, if that's all right. No, not souls. No souls? It can, it can, you can only reap one or the other. You can't have both. <laughs> oh, man. Lame. That's why the Grim Reaper never went to, got to um, farming. Uh, oh, fair enough. Fair enough. So, yes, in the Dragon Tiny 2, some of us have seen it, and we all just saw it pretty much just now. Yeah, we've seen it before, and, uh, yeah, that's, it's cool stuff. If that was what you wanted to know, it's, it's cool stuff. It is. Um, like I said, I could easily see it being <laughs> integrated very easily into a Imperial Guard army, very easily. Yeah. And none of us own any of their products, so we can't tell you nope. from a percent account how they are. But I actually think I... C- no, no, because the ones... No, I think I might have actually played in the game with a bunch of them, but I think there were a different army because they were diff- they were smaller base sizes and these were like saying you know perfect for the 28 millimeter bases. Yeah, were they uh the guys in the great coats with the cool helmets? No. The great coats like the long coat guys. They were actually like body armor. I don't remember. Like I have a horrible memory. Cuz there's also um that's funny. I went on the War Games Factory cuz War Games Factory makes another decent that's it. That was the War Games Factory. Yeah, I have I some of those guys. Those guys are all right. Uh, they look cool, but the only thing is when you pop them in the box, you find all these weird mutant Cthulian things in there, which you're not expecting. You're expecting sci-fi, you know, fascist stormtroopers, and then you get, you know, tentacle heads. A little surprising. They well, don't have clearly to be fascist. They don't have to be what? They don't have to be fascist. They could be That's tr- non-fascist. You know, they, they could be totalitarian. You're right. <laughs> you know, they could even be, I don't know, paint them up like uh, a Starbucks uh, worker and they could be capitalist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when I think sci-fi stormtroopers, I just assume it's a fascist government. Maybe that, that's a bit limiting of me. Yeah, it's very that, close-minded. That's it's racist. View. You're right. I apologize. I, I think it's a racist view. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on, um, I've got a couple of rumors here that um, just popped in. Um, one is is a Kodak a Codex release schedule, the, the yeah, supposed Kodak. one, the, which is the tower supposedly coming out, which has been pretty much clarified with White Dwarf releases. Well, pictures and the White Dwarf should be out what this coming week? This Friday, usually for us at least. Can I buy it like online right now? <laughs> I don't uh, know. In theory, um, yes, but it won't get to you until way after Friday. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> Um, then the next one, rumored, and this is coming from probably one of the more better sources, which has a higher probability of being right more than some of the other sources out there, mm-hmm. is um, Eldar being next, then Space Marines, then either Nids or Orcs, it's a toss-up, then Imperial Guard, and then either Nids or Orcs, depending on which one got the number four slot. Yeah. Yeah, There's I saw that I mean, All the stuff that is for... dropped on Bella Bluff Souls. Yep. Yep. There's rumor that there's going to be a new Rhino variant and a new suit that's smaller than a Dread but bigger than a Termi. It's there's... probably going to be. Oh. But... I, I, I would I would love for that to be an Ultramarine thing, just because a lot of people feel the Ultramarines have been working on improving because you know they're their own empire. Yeah. Yeah. But be cool enough like an Ultramarine like Mark Nine or something. That'd be kind of cool. That would be mm. cool. I can agree with that. There's talk that Black Templar have a chance of going back into the Space Marine book, but no one's sure about that rumor. I hope that's not true, to be honest. It, I kind of hope so. It could work, though. All you would just be, if you take a Black Templar, you must take the Empress Champion. That's a special thing for them. And you can, you're not allowed devastated whirlwind or whatever. Yeah, but the problem is, like, like the Emperor's Champion might get, like, turned into just, like, a company champion then, and it's not the as cool and flavorful. The Emperor's Champion be a generic HQ in the old 3rd edition codex. Yeah. The, um, it was just the Emperor's Champion was an HQ that anybody could take. Yeah. Yeah, I guess my fear is I, I like the fact that it's special to the Templars, and if they 
puts them back into the main space green codex that's going to be an everybody gonna... thing. And it's like, uh, they want to uh, take a captain or something, you know? I agree. I agree completely. Because then it kind of takes away the whole unique force organization of the Black Templars. Yeah. But maybe maybe it's not worthwhile to make a Black Templar to bowl into, like, a handful of people that play who buy the codex, you know? What, I would what love do you them think, to make um... What do you think, um, Matt? You're the Black Templar player of the group. Eh. Uh, I don't really have an opinion in either direction, to be perfectly frank. Um, well then, would you... So you wouldn't mind if they went back into the Space Marine Codex? Um... I mean, I, If they... I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, if, if they went back into the Space Marine Codex and they didn't, like, screw it up completely, then whatever. Okay, so it's more of a, as long as they don't screw it up, it's all good? Yeah. That, that, okay. That, you know, that's probably the best way to look at it. I mean, I hope they don't, but if they do put it back in, if it's still cool, then it's still cool, right? Yeah, I mean, that's all that matters is they don't screw up the Black Templars and give them a special character librarian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With no, no librarians for Black Templars, please. Yeah. 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 No. But, um, <laughs> that would be the biggest thing. <laughs> Another thing is is that with the Eldar, they're getting a new flyer, which, big whoop, everyone's getting a new flyer. Yeah, that's just the um, ca- New characters and a new Uber Wraith Guard thingy. Now, wouldn't that can be called a Wraith Lord, then? Because they are the Uber Wraith Guard? Maybe well, it's a special they're... thing in between. Well, I'm thinking, like, um, maybe the only thing oh, sorry. that they're going to do is maybe they're going to do, like, a Dread Knight thing and make it, you know, bigger than a Wraith Lord type of thing. Well, and make it like their super thing. It's, well, it, it depends on word choice and what they mean by it. If yeah. they mean a new Uber race guard thing that's pertaining to the race guard unit, it could be a warlock race guard or something like that. Yeah, or just Which, in general, a special character race guard could be cool. Yeah. It would be neat. Yeah. Um, if they were going to do like the Psyker thing, I would kind of prefer the Wraith Lord because the Wraith Lord, in a sense, in the fluff, as we're going like going off of fluff now, wraith lords are actually sometimes brought into the seer council for their advice on war. So it would make more sense to put the the psyker in the wraith lord thing than the wraith guard. Yes and no, because that's a forge world specific thing, and they may not want to deal with that. But then you know, oh, may- when has that ever stopped Games Workshop before? No, but it, it, they may not want to deal with that and make their own fancy wraith guard seer thing. And keep the wraith seer lord, you know, double profit. You want to get a wraith maybe. lord that looks cool and seer, or it could um, be both. Maybe. Yeah. It, maybe it's just me wanting to have the wraith lord, um, far se- um, wraith guard in the codex, so I can actually use the model in, like, if I ever go to an official tournament. Fair yeah, I mean, it could be one of it could be one of three things: some type of special wraith guard, that's some type of seer, or some type of, of um, or. Um, or it could be a special Wraith Lord, like the one we have already from Ford World. Or it could be a third completely different thing we know nothing about. Or, actually, I just thought of it. Remember when I brought up the special Aiden character last time where I thought they should bring her back? Yeah, but I mean, if you... Why don't we... No, I'm just saying, why don't... Why, maybe it could be that. Maybe it could be her in a Wraith Guard. Maybe. Be I fun. mean, it could be, like, it could be a fancy Wraith Guard, some type of special character of Wraith Guard or a special unit of Wraith Guard. Like maybe a mm-hmm. like a jumping one, for example. It could be a special race lord, or it could be a third something we know nothing about, like I don't know, a race jet bike squadron. Hmm, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> Just for fun, you know, something completely different. Uh, they know should make about. a special character uh, jet bike that has is possessed, like a wraith guard is, and call it Kit. I think that'd be great. No, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything about Hasselhoff. Just Kit. You are implying, David Hasselhoff, it's a package deal. You get one <laughs> and the other, and you don't get only one of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, if you buy the car that Kit is model off of, you buy David Hasselhoff, and he ha- and he's in the car with you every time you drive it. That must get complicated for Mr. Hasselhoff. It does, and it gets very annoying because he just randomly screams out lines from the show if something in the... It out there reminds him of an episode of the show and makes you late for work because you have to go chase down spies. Uh, well, at least you get to chase down spies, I guess. Yeah, but then it's your car and you have to ruin it, and him, then he goes no gives you backsies and runs away. Oh, and you have to fix it yourself? Yeah. Did the car at least talk to you then? 
Probably not. But like like as Mr. Feeney. <laughs> probably not. It's probably an impersonator. Ah, oh, lame. That actor was awesome, by the way. He was Maybe off topic. He was great in 1776, and no one knows what I'm talking about, and that's great. I know what you're talking about. That's a... don't don't judge me. <laughs> Um, sorry. He's also great Boy Meets World. He was. That's why I called him Mr. Feeney, because I actually don't remember the actor's yep. name. That was his name. Mr. Feeney? <laughs> yes. Well, I have to find First out. First name, Mr. Last name, Feeney. I'll be right back. I'm looking up. I don't know what I'm looking up. And while the Stark Lord looks that up, I there's this new thing going up. We did talk about a little bit of the new trade agreement with Games Workshop, where they're saying stores that buy directly from Games Workshop can't sell bits anymore. Yeah, yeah. But another interesting thing is, is there's two other pieces that came into factor with this. One of them was no store that buys directly from Games Workshop is allowed to sell their products online anymore. Yeah. So if you're a spe- if you're a re- if you're an official account holder at Games Workshop, then you're not allowed to post your mo- their models on your website for online purchases in the U.S. and Canada only. Yeah, it's it's a way they they can't do it where they're from because the Van Damme monopoly laws in effect. Tom Holland got around this these, but you know, in all honesty, it hurts things that are like an e online only type of store if all they sold yeah. is workshop stuff. But the other thing well, about it is they were making a point like you know, would you buy mo- like now you have to buy models at full price? And I just want to say I've never got a discount on a model ever. <laughs> For any store I went to, so I've been buying full price all along. According yeah. to Games Workshop, the, the the letter that came with it, their reasoning behind this is they don't like how Games Workshop models are being presented on third party websites and feel that the only place that properly displays the models as they should be displayed is the Games Workshop website. That's a funny way yeah. of doing that. Uh, I will yeah, say, I, I have gotten discounts them. online. Uh, you guys haven't, but I've I've worked hard on saving money on my Games Workshop stuff. So I'm a little sad, because when I got my uh, 90% of my Guard army, which I'm now getting rid of, uh, I bought off of Mini Wargaming when they're having a ridiculous sale, and I got basically about, I don't know, 50 guys for free technically, because I bought it the right way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, I, mean, I kind of miss that ability way- now. <laughs> They're, that's that's really never gonna go away. It's just gonna be hard to find. <coughs> well, the though, thing is, is yeah, I've watched is, the, this. Well, the, the mini war game, we put up a whole response to this and explained everything very nicely. They, they had a great response. It was very well put. And here's what they mean in any way. This is though, er, people like, and they called the whole bunch of people to go up, up in the arms as usual. Yep. We don't have, you know, they have to make certain things happy to make us unhappy because that's the way a big company like that works not just this but anywhere else and the whole online thing is a step in the wrong direction because you look at just because if you look at anything else in consumerism it multiple sites sell the same thing from one company you you should embrace it because it helps it just helps it also i think in a way like some people have brought up it helps sell the product more if there's more online stores available. Now, just one thing to be clarified, this only affects stores that get their product directly from Games Workshop. So like the War Store is affected by this, but some place like, say, Amazon or Grasshopper who purchase their products, their GW products, not directly from them, are still allowed to sell these items because the only thing Games Workshop can really do is cut off your supply. And if your supply isn't Games Workshop, then you have nothing to fear. Right. Yeah, if you are basically, I don't know if you, I forget the term, but if you a are a reseller or store, trader. Yeah, you're, you're like you have a trader store account. Through them, then yes, you have to go by all of the rules. And other companies that do not have that, they got to think, they got a way around it. The thing, yeah. that, yep. the thing that's unfortunate, and it's not... I mean, if the thing that's unfortunate is the value of money throughout the world because this really hurts place. This hurts and, in a way, is trying to help local places and countries where it's a lot easier to buy from a different country and get it shipped to you, like Australia, where it's yeah. a boatload of money to buy a Games Workshop model. Oh, it's ridiculous if they would get it from other there. countries. But uh, doing this is not the way... Like, there's, there's a better way of trying to normalize yeah. the cost of the models throughout the world. But, again... I don't have shareholders. I never will have a shareholder. So I don't have 
the person who's got all the monies that I have to please are the people. Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing that people have to keep in mind is that when, when you're talking about a and make no mistake, Games Workshop is huge. Um, when you're dealing with that, and it's a it's a European based company, and they got shareholders to, to keep happy, you got to do it. You got to base. They sold out. It's a sellout. You have to sell out yeah. to your shareholders every time they want you to do something, or else they could really hurt you. Now, another thing is also the direct sale um, policy has changed. Um, you guys know what direct sale is? The models uh, that are not yeah. stopped, you have to, they, only, they okay. only get like $500 worth of those models yes. that are only. Um, which is any games, Yes, it's basically really for anyone who doesn't know what this is, is, there's two types of catalogs that Games Workshop puts out. There's like the AMDT trade um, group, which is basically every model that you see in a store is what you can purchase from this catalog. And they're what are called the, what Games Workshop deems the quote unquote popular models. And that's where you can purchase as many as you want at any time you want, and Games Workshop will just keep shelling them out each time you ask for them. Then there's the direct sale stuff. This is where the models that are unpopular, like the brand new Herald of Corn and Herald of Slanish, well, are well, actually well, on this list. They're not. It shouldn't. It, let's not confuse it. It's it, that's where it gets shady. The direct sale stuff is models like specialist games, and all, certain old models that may go out or come be faded to a resin or whatever, and certain single blister models are put on direct sale. Some of them are because they're not popular, and then they put some of them that are just brand new up there for whatever reason. The common theory now is to promote sales from their website because yeah. some of these models are like name character models that are brand new or refurbished or re -new, like new HQs that are brand new for the codex. And the fact that they're direct only is kind of weird. Yep, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, a lot of thing now going off of this is it has been like it, the it could loose be. translation is is that the loose categorization is the rec sale is one of the less selling models. Well, um, yes and no, when because a, it's not selling or brand new. If you notice, a lot of the codex codices have been coming out with the resin cast stuff. The brand new models go direct sale only. Yep, I'd imagine and they do that the things so is, that well, they don't have to produce as many as quickly. Well, maybe they the, can't, or maybe they just don't want to, and they want to test the waters. Well, the official answer, the yeah. official answer from say a Games Workshop vendor, is these are models that they're concerned aren't going to sell, and they don't want them sitting on the shelf, basically making the mo the army look bad. Because you go, oh, there's 50 of these Eldar units that aren't selling. Clearly, this army isn't popular. I'm going to buy the the Space Marines because they're practically empty every day. But the long and the short of it is, is you used to be able to these basically these were special orders you had to go up to the to the game store counter and go i'd like to order this model mm -hmm. and that's how you'd get it well games workshop has limited that down to five hundred dollars a month so if you happen to be the one person whose whose order puts them over their five hundred dollar limit you have to wait a one one month period before Games Workshop yeah. will process the order, and then you have to wait the one to two weeks that Games Workshop takes to send you the item. On a side yeah. note, that used to be $5,000 a month, so they cut it yep. down to 10% of what it used to be. Like, I know plenty of stores that used to do direct orders all the time. That's how I got half of my sister's stuff. Like, the yep. Exorcist has never been a store in a building. I had to get yep. both those direct order, and so now that makes that a lot harder, considering one of those is 50 bucks. I order two of those, say that's 100 bucks, and that's 20% of that store's monthly trade, and, and that's one person. They, they did it so that they forced more internet sales. That's all I can and tell. And the, the worst thing also about it is it makes a lot of models not be aware. Like, did you guys know there's a resin kit of Wraith Guard? Nope. Yeah. They're, they have a resin kit of Wraith Guard, and it actually... Buying the pot packs to make a 10-man squad is now $30 cheaper because of this box kit, and yeah. I just found out that it existed. Oh, yeah, no, they existed for a while. The thing is, this whole limiting money thing is to promote sales on GW's website. Website. Yes, most of these models are models that are just, you wouldn't buy, no, like, it's, I need this. It's a one-off, almost. Like, I need this. Yeah. Not many people like, for example, it's just Space Marine, like Captain or something. You're only going to well, need one of them. I, mean, I, I just want to say one thing. The idea is oh, 
Pay direct only. You can get a good sense of what it is by going to UW's website and seeing what direct only models there are. Some of them are just don't sell much. And a decent amount of them are brand new things that come out. Like either, not so much the Wraith Guard one, fine cast, but brand new. Like models, yeah, like the Herald of Corn. Yeah. That a lot of people are looking at it, scratching their head, going, all right, you should make this, should, you know, this is for a codex that just dropped. Why is it direct only? It's a little weird. And the, those models, the whole concept of dropping it of 500, it's forcing you to go through GW's website because they're viewing it as more hits on our website, more sales on our website equals more direct profit, therefore we're selling more. When really, they could be selling the same amount, they're just seeing more hits on their website. Yeah, it, it that's the, the weird website. part about it. Uh, what bo- bothers me about it is a lot of the stuff they're like, they're saying, they've been saying for years that they try and help brick and mortar so- stores all the time. But this is clearly a anti brick and mortar thing. It's taking people out of local gaming stores and saying, "Don't buy with the community. Go online and buy it from there." That's kind of why I'm mad at that whole thing. It, like I'm I not did mad find... because you can still buy ninety percent of what you need for an army there, unless you have special yeah. armies that they just don't support, which is yeah. a completely separate issue. But yeah, you can. Yeah. If, well, I can get most of all I need right from my local store. It's just that some of these special things gets annoying, but it also promotes. It's, it's just like any other store online. You put that in your shopping cart, you go check out, do you need this, this, and this? Maybe you do, and you click it, maybe you don't, and you move on. Yeah. Well, the other thing, though, is, is it, in my opinion, what it upsets me about is it kind of, in a way, with certain armies, limits the types of armies you're seeing on the field. Because... So that, that won't actually happen. Well, like, think of it, like, the Eldar right now, like, you never see any Wraith Guard armies, but normally, probably, and a lot of it is, like, at least for me, I was planning on doing a Wraith Guard army, but I can't find Wraith Guard anywhere, and so I end up just building the generic Eldar list that everyone else has. See, I, I, I disagree with that statement in part because... I love Race Guard too, and I would like to do it, but I, I keep up with GW's website. I use that most of the time to get at least, an, again, appraisal of what I want to get or purchase certain things right away, you know, because I don't always, I don't have time to go to a local store every week or whatever it is. So I just purchase it, and by the time I would have time to go to a store, it comes to my house. But also, it's, I, I wouldn't say it limits the RNG see because a lot of people just don't think Race Guard are worth for the points right now. So I, you're not going to see somebody play generic space Marine list number one because they didn't want to make space Marine list number three because they couldn't find it they're playing it because that's viewed to be the most popular and effective list and it's not so much i can't get the models because if i especially for now yes the younger generation this is a whole other step they can't just go on with cash and their allowance and get it they got to talk to mom and dad to order it online that's unfortunate but a lot of it if i can't find it in the store I just go out to GW's website, see the price, and see if it's like a direct order only, and I just order it. Because I feel if I'm going to do a direct order sale, I do it home. I mean, there are some places that will give me, used to give me a little discount where I did it, but that's all the way out where, you know, like an hour away from me. So I just order it at home anyway. It's the same direct order sale, only it comes to me. So... I think what I think for me at least the the appeal to direct order is um, through a store is the shipping because I very rarely spend more than say thirty dollars and I'd rather if I can get a store to buy it for me and not have to pay the shipping deal because I didn't feel like spending fifty dollars I'd rather go that route. I never really had a problem with shipping. Most of the time I'm able to pretty much get shipping knocked off. Yeah, but, but for Games Workshop, you need fifty dollars to do it. Unless you're doing yeah, other promos, like, I, I, I stop doing. Yeah, yeah, but I very rarely, and that's things like for me, like say the average, let's just say for the average person who's not building an army from the ground up, just needs you know one or two little extra things. I find that it would be better if I could just go to the store and not have to pay the shipping because I just because I already bought my whole army already. No, it's good. You know, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I just usually just go, I'll get this, and then I pick something else up, kind of what I do on Amazon when I buy some other stuff and yeah, buy it's, stuff. Yeah, but that clever, we're also it's assuming that, clever marketing. that people have a local gaming store within reasonable distance. You, there's a, plenty of places throughout the country and I'm sure other countries where you really don't have a store that's not two hours away, where it's not even feasible. Yeah. So we're lucky that we have multiple, but there are plenty of places that the local store is either a GW store or the local store is almost two hours away. So, true. in that regard, 
Mm-hmm. You got to look at the DW website and other websites that they would go to, be it Mini Wargaming, the Warstar, wherever. And that's the part that's annoying is the whole online thing. Because maybe you just like just give Warstar your money, let's say, right? Yeah. But in all honesty, it's unfortunate. I don't want people to lose their jobs over it, but it comes down to a com- company's got to make the people who invest in them happy. They got the, the and, company has to be profitable, and it's a good move for profits for them. It just unfortunately well, it bugs the community a lot. Yeah, and of course it will. And, it, and the yeah. profits for them is we'll have to wait and see if there's really any change. It may do it just because more hits on the site, but they're doing what's in their best interest, and a company should always do what's in their best interest. It's unfortunate they're doing it in a way that does not help the people who buy from them. But now. Do you think that what Mini Wargaming says, do you agree with Mini Wargaming saying that what Games Workshop is doing now is only going to help them in the short term and end up hurting them in the long term? It maybe. It, For me, it tell. depends to see what the next step is going to be. Yeah. Mm. It's very hard to tell. If they just stop at this point, then yeah, it's a short term thing that won't do a lot in the long term. We have to assume that they're doing something on a grander scale and we not being part of the shareholders or the higher ups don't know their whole plan so we don't know everything they're doing all I can say is that as they progress with this plan they eventually stop doing things that get the majority of the community mad now <laughs> here's one thing I made a statement to the Stark Lord earlier this year um, this week and I was wondering if you got get your input on the statement do you guys agree or disagree with the idea that Games Workshop right now is looking at their product line less like a hobby game and more like a toy line? Like a good example is, is you know, the, the whole standard of, oh, get them interested now. Who cares if they're interested in a month from now? They bought it when it came out, and that's all that's important. Um, do you feel like they're try- they're taking more of like treating Warhammer 40k like a series of toys rather than a hobby game where let's get the person now and then we have a 50 bucks a month from 20 people constantly for the rest of their life of the game? Uh, I think that they're looking at it still as a, a war game. And the whole reasoning I think that is as much as we, not we, that people will bash them all the time. They didn't get to be a huge company by not knowing what they're doing. So I very much feel they have, they know what they're doing as far as making sure they stay afloat and profit and grow because they've been growing. And yeah. I think the fact that we see new codices drop and we see additions and that they maintain with the RADA and FAQ and the fact that it's, that they, they're just if it was just one and done, we would. I don't think we would see as much kind of hands in the stew type of thing. I feel very much that they still treat it as a war game, but a little caveat here: not so much that it's a toy thing, but it's less. I think it's less maintain it and more. Let's just bring out the next edition or yeah. you know the new model. Um, basically, the higher up business plan for the company is clearly one that's about. Uh getting the new person playing and just get them started because the new person's the person's going to spend the most money on the game that's that been true. proven by them before like usually someone comes in they spend maybe a couple hundred couple thousand dollars like people spend a lot really quick and then they drop out after a year or two and those are the people they're focusing on primarily from a business standpoint which is why they're constantly putting out new things saying hey check this buy it now kind of stuff and that's also probably in a sense why they try to alter things to a degree to get the old person player to buy the same amount as the new player sometimes. Yeah, well, they, oh, yeah again, they, they, they're aiming for the people that have bought zero product because those are the people that they can make the most gain off of. And they are, kinda, and they also, yeah. Yeah, they also right. hit people but maybe have been in it and spending 50 bucks here and there by going, you know, this is a good example. Flyers. You know, if you didn't yeah. buy a... If you weren't playing an army that had the things that became flyers already, and even if you were and you didn't use them, well, now here's a whole new realm for you to invest your money in. Here's Sixth Edition. Here's flyers. Here's the new KS Statesman Codex. Here's the new this. The whole new drop is what tries to get some of the old players to spend a couple hundred bucks again, as well as getting new people into it. And, you know, like I said, they know what they're doing. We may think they don't, but they know what they're doing. Yeah. And, they, and we may not like it, and it may seem short-sighted, 
But they know what they're doing in respect to being a huge company and having shareholders to make happy. Yeah, they, I mean, they've been around doing, for a while. What they're doing is definitely making them a profit. Again, it's just, I feel, I don't want to say I feel, but it, it's good uh, short-term definite profit making, but it's not community building. And it's interesting because most other companies that are in the wargaming field are really focusing on keeping their communities. And you can see there's been more and more of a shift of a lot of players going over to them because like, oh, hey, they care about the veterans in these companies. And Games Workshop is tending to not really go towards that. Yeah, but think about it's, it. Those places have not become big enough to basically have a self-sustaining community. This is true. I mean, we can only uh, maybe in ten years they'll end up doing the same thing GW does for some. Yeah, them, like I'm not for it. I'm just guessing that once your community gets to a certain size where it's almost self-sustainable as a community to put on its own tournament, you have you have just enough presence to kind of make them feel like okay, we can fall back and figure stuff out through them. But once you can, it almost becomes a point where. If your community gets too big, you can't keep it. you can't do such a micro, you know, organization through there and attendance. If it gets huge and multinational and how many different languages and all that jazz, you know, mm-hmm. it just I feel like it becomes not almost impossible, but just if it's I feel like you get to a certain size and you try to focus on community a lot, like you become megalithic in size, that's all you're doing. You're not producing content. You're st- you become stagnant a little bit. So it's unfortunate we would like to see it, but I think it may also be a thing of, hey, our community is big enough to be self-sustaining. Let's focus on the people just getting into it because it's such a big community, they may feel intimidated. That may be their mindset, but it's coming across as, we just want more of your money. Yeah. Um, interesting note, I never knew this. Did you guys know that you're not allowed to sell Games Workshop products if you carry 18-plus products in your store? Yeah, I yeah. knew that. Because they want to make sure it's always family-friendly. Well, they want to make sure they can get the demographic of 12 years and up. Yeah. But I never knew that that was a rule. Yeah, Yeah. that's a rule. I mean, they're a family company. And a lot of family companies have a similar rule. Yep. Which is, it's just, you never think of it because it never crosses your mind. Like, I'm never going to an AT and up store thinking, hmm, maybe I can get some models. You know, I'm not (laughs) thinking about that if I go into those stores. This is true. (laughs) While I'm here, let me see if they have some space marines. Exactly. You <laughs> feel a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what's no. interesting? What? But. And I wonder if there's, if, I don't know if this is one step of a two step program. But before that, I do agree with Mini Wargaming. If, if they're going to drop these rapid things, don't give your own reasons. Let us make up our own reasons and make us comfortable. But really, we haven't seen anything yet, and there's no real way to do it. But I'm surprised GW hasn't tried. To try and bring down some of those armies painted to order places where you because you're not paying for you're technically paying for an artistic person's time. But I'm surprised they haven't tried to figure a way to kind of stop the whole pro painted army business. Yeah, I don't um, think they can stop that. Well I think well I think well, not in a sense, I like those companies, but I don't think well, they can I think stop it's it. more of a it's more of a in a way, kind, I think they're seeing it as a way of getting more products sold because here's a good example is say – let's say I'm just you know some average Joe, and I was like, oh, wow, I'd really like to get into this army, but you know, oh, I'm not going to paint them. I'm just going to have plastic models and or maybe even go, I'm not going to play the game because my paint job stinks. These paint-to-order places kind of gets more people – into buying armies because they're like, oh, wow, I can buy the army and then pay these dudes to paint it. And it gives more of an incentive for some people to play because they know they don't have to do the one aspect of the game that they don't like. Oh, exactly, but I'm surprised they haven't tried to figure out the whole, because a lot of these places, you just pay them total cost, they'll purchase the models and they'll paint them. I'm surprised yeah. they haven't tried to figure out a way, not that I'm surprised I'm trying to pit on them, but if you think about it, if they were going to really kind of be militant on this. I'm surprised that wasn't some type of clause saying if you are not a partnered retailer or whatever it is with Games Workshop and a seller, then you can you can only spend you know and you can't if you're spending let's say five thousand dollars a month in total pro, in total you know units and you're not a store like a brick and mortar actual store, then you know maybe there's a problem. Like not that they well, would because you're I, getting money, hmm. but I, just, I think it's it well. They they well, they're still 
Games Workshop models are still being bought, they're still being used, so they're still making their profit. They might not be making and a profit on the paint, though, because a lot of those places don't use, use Citadel games paints. Workshop paints. The yeah. only thing also is, the loophole is, is they just don't make a... They don't make trade accounts with Games Workshop, so they have no way to keep track of them. Exactly. Because they can go, oh, just this dude, this dude named Mini Wargaming is buying five thousand dollars worth of models awesome i don't know yeah. what mini wargaming is but awesome or whatever um worthy painting or blue table well, the probably... thing is though blue table is a registered gw seller i thought or at least they used to be when they, they, used to be, they don't actually have a store anymore so the yeah model. yeah okay because i know he started I, out that way by like i want to buy more I, models i'll make a store and then I he might have had a he might have made like <clears throat> trade account with them where he gets the discount on the models but basically, he probably still gives them some sort of. He probably goes. He probably has an, a deal with them where they go. Okay, we buy the models if if we're a store, but we pay the price as if we're a consumer because we're charging people the price you would charge them. Yeah, I mean, and this is just all examples of how they're not really being real put on this because they're not trying to chase after something that's really hard to chase after. I mean, yeah. This just shows, I mean, this to me, you know, I just pull it up, throw it out there as an example, we get discussion, but it's really not going to happen, and people have to understand that the companies aren't, not just Game Workshop, but any company is going to go attacking everything, because they understand what feeds them. So, yeah. It's happening. But speaking of painted and non-painted, what are your thoughts on the whole Star Wars X-Wing TIE Fighter miniature thing? Uh, what about it? Like, well... Your thoughts on it in general. Your thoughts. Your general uh, thoughts. I have yet to play the game. My friend has a copy. I'll eventually get around to it. It looks like it's solid. Uh, it's just a fun little game. That's all it really is, though. I I saw I saw um, a bunch of guys at Brothers Grimm getting ready to play a game, and some of the stuff he was talking about, I was like, this is starting to get a little confused. Like, it seems like the rules are pretty solid, but when it starts coming to distance measuring and such, it seems to get a little complicated in my opinion. Um, I haven't, there hasn't been anything there making me go, oh my, I gotta own this game type of thing. Like, yeah. it's very just like, eh, it's there, it's cool, whatevs. It's, uh, yeah. it's a nice intermediate game, it's like Hero Clicks was, where it's like pre-painted figures, cool, nice, quick, easy, play around with it, have fun for a while, and that's kind of it. No. Yeah. It's cool that they're painted. I like the fact that they're paint. I haven't seen one up close to see how, like, you know, if people would be would try to do touch ups to it or not. Uh, people do, but they're, they're about. Yeah, yeah they're, well, yeah, they're no different than, that. Yeah, they're they're no different than like hero clicks. Yeah, again, well, yeah, the same level I mean, of painting as hero clicks, and people do touch those up too. So it's well, there's a difference. There's hero clicks, and then there's hero clicks where the stuff looks like it's been horribly done. You know, depending <laughs> on the hero click game. So I wonder how <laughs> well this is in the hero click line. Um, they, if they I were to debate. say, if I were to say a good paint describe, I'd say it would be like a Hasbro action figure from them is like their paint job quality. That's, that's pretty decent. Yeah. But my concern, looking at the prices, like you know, it's like what, ten, fifteen dollars for one flying thing, um, and then thirty dollars for like the Millennium Falcon. My concern is the overall size of this is meant to be because the way they describe it, you know, X and they describe it correct. Tie fighters utilize numbers because they're really not that good of a ship. So I'm wondering, just on overall game size for either side, if it becomes kind of a thing where it's like, wow, this is getting out of hand. Is all I'm concerned about because the prices per one dude is pretty high. But what do you if think? It's only that? like five dudes, then it's it. What do you think about the X-Wing game? Who? Me? You. Yeah. Uh, eh? it's, it's it's space naval stuff, so I don't really care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, it's um, space dogfighting, not space naval. I don't know. I'm oh, speaking like, hey, hey, it's all the same. I'm kidding. You know, I'm kidding. It's all the same. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm it's like 15, it's 15 bucks a model, and they look like there's only one model in each pack. Yep. Um, again, they don't. It's not terrible pricing. I mean, it's not. I'd great. have to see how many ships are used in a game to really make a judge on the cost. Yeah, yeah. Because like, if it's like five, if it's like ten ships, then yeah, it's ridiculously overpriced. But if it's only like three, 
then it's a little pricey, but not to the point where it would detract me. Oh man, they got Slave 1. I might have to pick up this game. Yep, it's <laughs> Slave 1 for $30 or the Millennium Falcon. That was like their new introduction. They also have um, a tie Interceptor, which just looks cool. Now uh, I'm curious. I, I, is this going to get like clicks like? Like, I used to be in the Mage Knight. Yeah. And Mage Knight was awesome. I only had one of us time to play it, and we just played each other and got bored because it was just us two playing. And we really didn't know the rules too well, but <laughs> that eventually got crazy with, you know, four click model based things, huge juggernaut kind of kill you, and it's kind of like, I wonder if this is going to go into that, cause into that mindset, like, here's the Death Star, burr, 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 and it's kind of like, oh boy, you know? Well, in a sense, like, just going off of that for a sense, I kind of like that, that, that drive in a hobby game a little bit more. I like the idea of, here's a set of dudes, okay? And then, okay, here's an extra set of dudes. These dudes are add-ons. You don't need them, but if you want to, you can have them. I kind of like that setup a little bit more because it kind of feels less like I'm getting cheated out of my out of the models I just purchased and more giving me incentive to make my battles bigger and grander. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can play the initial a... game with just the initial game pack, which is like, I think, 20 like, bucks. Yeah. And it's got a couple like, of ships in, and that's why I really need to start. And if you want to add more stuff, you can. I think that's one of the reasons why War Machine is so popular right now, because they go it when the fray of, okay guys, here's the model lineup, you need the, you can you can build an army with these guys. And then the next book comes out, okay guys, here's a new faction, and here's three or new guy, three or four new guys for the other armies. Now, these new guys are not essential to fight this new faction, but they're just there in case you wanted to play a little bit more of a shooty army, a more of a close combat army. These models will help you produce that, whereas the old models, you only had one unit or thing. I kind of like that feel, and I think that's why more people are going towards War Machine, because they're feeling less conned out of their money. Well, what it comes down to I, is it, War Machine does, and what a couple other companies do really well also, is they have a great starter pack. Uh, yeah. Because all the starters are pretty well balanced against each other. Not perfect, but really close to being about the same amount of points, with the same basic stuff. And you can start playing right then, full game, no problem. And if you like it, you can build off of it, but you don't have to, unless you get really into the tournament scene, and then you start spending pretty ridiculous amounts of 40k See, level money. But yeah, so. I like that. I like that feel too in a full-fledged war game. My problem yeah. when it got that way with the clicky stuff is that the clicks got complicated. <laughs> like to the yeah. point where kind of like click. it's not worth it. What That's happened with clicks like, was gonna, really it, annoying. Uh, originally, clicks were designed so all the information was on the stupid click. Maybe you had one reference sheet that just told you what the green color was, but eventually you remember yeah. green on strength being super strength, easy to remember, or charge, whatever it meant. But yeah, eventually it got to the point strength. where you need like three different special cards for each click, and it became silly. Yeah. It was like, my well, Spider-Man this. Mean this. Hey, yeah. that, that's my concern, because this space dogfight thing, you know, it's not really a click. It's, it's click-esque, we could say. But yeah, if we're gonna get into so that, here's the Death Star with four different tables of damage that it can take, and boop boop boop, and here's the here's the, you know a Mon Calamari cruiser, and then you need all of it. Like it feels like it could become a very a game that gets really bogged down in the little detail, just like Click well, eventually did. Yeah. It's it true. feels right right now like that they kind of have that because I was talking to a friend who was playing the game. He's like, "See, now you got this measuring stick. Now, see if you fire within this section, you do this. But if you fire in this section, you get negatives and then bonuses. But if you fire in this section and you're over here on the left and the right, then this bonus happens. But if you're coming up from above, then this bonus happens. It's like, whoa, whoa, too many bonuses going on it, at it once. It sounds here. like BFG shooting right there. You know, with the the table. Just well. <laughs> On the other thing is, BFG only has that table for one weapon. Everything else is standard, roll a die, <laughs> did you pass? Yes, you did something. Fair enough. Yeah, you know, true. this one where it's, this one is where the weapon table compl complication, it seems to be spread across everything. Well, they're trying to really, with the X-Wing game, and again, the system, I haven't played it, but it's supposed to be pretty solid, it's supposed to be trying to show you three-dimensional dogfighting. So yeah. you have to have bonuses since you can't literally be flying under the guy coming straight at him on a tabletop. It doesn't work. <laughs> Unless we create a zero G. <laughs> no, we'll create a zero G bubble dome for 3D gaming. And then we'll no, make it, we'll, make it, we'll start playing Blitzball in it. Let's do it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if this is 100 percent true or not, but I've been reading on the interwebs about this that the same is through Fantasy Flight. 
that they want to, that the way it's set up is so they can, can introduce Star Trek and then have Star Wars versus Star Trek dogfights. Uh, yeah, Star Trek, the uh, Gale Force 9 is baking a second, which is actually a third Star Trek miniature naval game, and they got the rights to use the Fantasy Flight X-Wing maneuverability rules. So technically, right. you can use them together, but you shouldn't because that sounds stupid because the scaling will be wrong, and the Enterprise fighting an X-Wing makes no sense to me. It no, it makes, makes no total sense, sense at all, but I heard it that it's actually sense. there so you can do it. It means you go, oh boy, here See, comes really the Star Trek Wars and Star Wars Trek. Yeah, I, See, I hope Star it Lord, you're 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 forgetting the fact that in the Star Wars universe, the bigger cruisers do jack. <laughs> it's true, but like I'm, I'm they're just going to see a people. Federation starfighter. They're not going to go send the Mon Calamari cruiser. They're going to say no. Send a wave of X wings at it until it dies. But they'll <laughs> die immediately because phasers don't miss. Oh, we, they, but we Star Trek shield. ships are weak. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's not do this. Let's not do this. We're going to call it the Star Trek Wars and Star Wars Trek, and we don't need it. Um, no, but, I demand that everyone knows that Star Trek But what are you going to do? Put a Star Destroyer against the, the Enterprise? The Enterprise is going to get manhandled because the Star Destroyer has about a million cannons. Yeah, but, but they're all honest, lasers that get stopped by shield. The shields oh. stop everything. Oh, no, yes, no, but Star no. Star Destroyer has shields, too. Yeah, their shields there suck. Are... They get taken out by an A-Wing crashing into it. That's so lame. You have to know, you have to, know to shoot the shield generator. If you don't know where the shield generator is, those <laughs> yeah. shields are impervious. And, and also, let's not forget, the Star Destroyer has three shield generators. <laughs> they can shoot the one on the bridge and fire at the body, going, Why did it go down? We just shot it. Not realizing they shot the bridge's shield, not the body's Look, shield. Anyways, and, just, and also... Just, the Star Destroyer has a full complement of fighters and bombers on it. Yeah, yes. but they don't use those in Star Trek because they're pointless in Star Trek. That's why no one has fighters. And let's not forget that in Star Trek, shields do jack because after one hit, they go down. No, they go to and 80%. Think about it. If, you got, if you got a Star Destroyer that's got enough laser cannons to bombard a planet to dust, a couple of salvos into anything Star Trek-wise, shield-wise, is going to drop the shield. It's just like at the board. The board drops I, I shields and the laser cutters. Only, uh, I, I hate to point this out, but people forget this. Uh, a single phaser bank can vaporize a city in about three seconds. Uh, so it's okay, equivalent to weaponry that's blocked by the same kind of shields. Just saying. People don't talk about that. There's only one. Theories, but phasers are destructive craziness. Yeah, and the lasers in Star Wars are equally destructive craziness. It's just that it's one bombarding the entire planet. Um, but think about it. Just... If you want to put it, the laser cutters from the board drop shields like it's nothing. So now you get a whole bank of these broadside in you because apparently broadside still works in space, uh, or not, even are... not firing forward. I mean, it's the same equivalent as if you had um, if you had the uh, the cruisers from um, the Zentradi warships from Robotech. They have a full laser bombardment that just goes forward. It's just going to overwhelm everything. It's, it's a pointless debate because we don't even know how the shields are on the same scale in the two universes, let alone their weapons. It's a it's dumb true. debate, but it always happens. It's, it's, but, a, it's a silly debate because it's like, well, we don't know how phasers and Star Wars shields interact and vice versa the other way around. All i got to say is a lightsaber, all, uh, lightsaber wins, obviously. And yeah. Luke, will just, Luke will just cloak the universe because he does that. Luke did cloak <laughs> a lot of stuff with his brain. So uh, if we bring Jedi until, in... Yeah, until yeah. Timothy Zahn came around and fixed that. It's true. Anyway, but it's such a it's such a pointless debate, but you get to like you know, this game, which is going to happen if those two games get to interact correctly. Because who's not going to want to throw their Federation fleet against the Star Wars fleet? I Just to know. prove that their Federation fleet is better than Star Wars, and you know every Star Wars nerd is going to go after the Star Trek game to prove that the Star Wars character, the Star Wars ships, are better than Star Trek ships. All right, guys, I gotta it's run. A, okay, right, I'll talk to you guys later. See you soon. But it, it, it's such a pointless debate because this, it's just so it's so dumb. It's just so dumb. But it's it's funny at the same time just to picture it in your head because you have no idea what's going to happen. It's true. Because you shouldn't because it should never happen. And this game is going to cause horrible, horrible things to happen, including loss of friendship for people. I guarantee it. It is. <laughs> we we almost just got into blows over this because they were talking on the internet. <laughs> yeah. On, on a complete hey. upload tangent out of this, so let's get out of this topic. I just want to say that one of our fearless viewers just won a free T-shirt for winning for eating an entire one-pound burger. He just texted me that. So let's get awesome. to a different topic. <laughs> well, that's good. And um, that's good. 
That's fun. I wonder if they do that in Star Wars or Star Trek. Back on topic. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Cleon, I only eat more than Mon Calamari. No, I said. I am totally convinced that on Tatooine they have hamburger eating contests at the Mos Eisley Space Park. And, and you know what? All the Tusken Raiders hate that because they're killing their bands. Yes. <laughs> they're killing their banthas because it's bantha meat because banthas are pretty much the cows of Star Wars. They are. The poor things. <laughs> are awesome. All i got to say is I, I am with those Tuscans. I'm a huge Tuscan Raider fan, and they, don't, they need to get some respect back. My personal I, I favorite respect Tuscan the Tuscan Raider. Raiders. I'm just afraid of them because they're a little crazy. Not going to lie. Oh, yeah, they are. Hey, they're hey, completely hey, crazy. hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Has been seeing a therapist, and he's gotten a lot better at his anger management. <laughs> That's good. Has he put your dad sure? down yet? Yes. Okay, that's a start. You know, and let's just bring up the great debate, not debate, but the great thing with uh, the Tuscan Raiders. You know, of course, episode four, that blast, there's two athletes for Tuscan Raiders, and episode one, they're shooting pod racers out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pod racers moving at how fast is those things going? Like 300 kilometers an hour at least? Well, they're going, they're go, they have starship equivalent engines on them. They're doing like Mach 3, okay? I'm just going to make up a number now. <laughs> yeah, the Tuscans are shooting them out of the sky. <laughs> yep. Well, but the I black plan is huge well, crawlers, too accurate. You can't have well, the Tuskies no. do this. Half the Imperial think... Stormtroopers who haven't hit anything while on screen directly ever. I think the whole point was is that the blast points were too precise at critical locations on I the don't sand know, crawler. Man. Whereas the I think they're there. going. Yeah, well, the Tuskens live there, but if you notice in the in the scene, the Tuskens were just firing, and they only actually hit one ship in an engine. Like, they just kept randomly banging off of Anakin's pod. But they so were I think shooting was... his pod and hitting it with solid projectiles while they were going that fast. That's pretty impressive. I, I view it as basically the local count... hillbillies are having fun again. I mean, yes, it's not... but, you have to count, but you have to account for um, how many shots were fired versus how many shots were hit. I think it was more of a point that the stormtroopers hit the sand crawler in such a way where in like two or three hits they had it disabled. Oh, I, Whereas, I get what they're going for, but if you think about this, Tuscan Raiders firing on pods is kind of like the, the yokel locals are having fun again. But they you know, live with by Jawa. They know all of the critical places if they really want to raid it. So I think, if anything, it points out how trained starting strong troopers are. Like, you know, we just landed here. Oh, look, it's a sand crawler. Okay, shoot here, 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 and it's gone. You know? Mm. Like I said, I think it was supposed to be more just the number of shots it takes and everything like that. Yeah. Look, it's a bad line. It's almost as bad as, you know, doing the Kesseron hey, hey, and hey. 12 parsecs. Hey, that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. Don't obviously. tell me you don't understand what he was talking about, because uh, I understood what he was talking about. Asteroid, and somehow cut the distance down through Crete. What well, I want to know... The whole run is how, is how short of a distance you can do it in. That's because the Kessel Run, you need to take as long a trip as possible to avoid not getting killed. Well, here's what I want to know. Was it time for a standing start or a rolling start? That's all I want to know. Was he a complete dead move, like stationary how to do this? Or was he moving already and got abandoned? Um, if, my, if I understand it correctly, I think the Kessel Run is, is you have to you start at a particular point. And then it's a three, two, one, go. And is there other ships he's racing against, or is it a time trial? I mean, I, I really would like to see this in a movie. I think it's not a time thing. I think it's literally you. You. I think you have like you just have to. You have to just set your trip, your um, your um, mile counter to trip mode, and see how many. Dis right. How much? How long you travel to get? But to is it like one at a time, or is it like Outlaw Star style? Um, that they don't go into, as far as I'm aware. I think they do talk about it in one of the books once. Look, all I know is in episode which, seven, that well star. Shows, okay? What? In episode seven, they'll, they'll, they'll let us know. They'll, they'll show it. Well, well I don't it. know. J.J. Abrams has decided he's not going to follow the books. Don't worry. So, which I'm going to love, which I'm going to love to see how all the Star Wars novelists handle 22 years of history getting wiped off the face of the earth. It's fine. This but I want to know is how much lens flare is going to be on those lightsabers. A Dude, lot. You're going to have to wear special, like, looking at the sun during an eclipse lenses, okay? <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's just going to be... And when, when they turn on those sabers, it's just going to be pure lens flare for the rest of the movie. Yep. There's there's gonna gonna be be lens you're going to go blind. He no, will make a be... saber that is just lens flare. I can see they're it. They're going to be... No, no, no. Every time the lightsaber's on, there's going to be lens flares reflecting off everything the light touches. <laughs> It'll be that. <laughs> of course. But, uh... 
Yeah, that, that that's that's gonna happen for sure. I'm interested. And to just see imagine it. if he turns on a lightsaber next to C-3PO. Oh God, no! Oh He'll turn God. into like the sun. <laughs> a I have ball. become more powerful than you could ever imagine. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna see C-3, C-3PO. No, that's no, no. That's if George Lucas was continuing. No, because he liked keeping Anthony Daniels in the suit, but they're gonna CG him in this one, make him shine here. <laughs> No, but he can still be in the suit. So it's going to be a green suit, so they can yeah. still all the green screen gold on him. Mm-hmm. It's going to be so shiny that the audience will, will be able to see their own reflection in him. <laughs> <laughs> That's how shiny he will be. Is it bad and, that I'm honestly very excited for these movies because Luke is no. directly involved? No, it's not I bad love at it. All. It's Star Wars, and it's more Star Wars for me. Okay, okay. to be perfectly okay, good. to be perfectly honest, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail from this, but I actually enjoy the prequels. I enjoy them. They are Star Wars. They are part of the Star Wars universe. I get my entertainment out of them. Whether I, I enjoy Lucas, them as well. It, whether it be George I go Lucas, back and forth whether it be I Michael them. Bay, whether it be J.J. Abrams, whether whoever it is, it's Star Wars. So I'm going to get enjoyment out of it. I'm just not going in expecting the originals, and yeah. that's where I think a lot of people get their disappointment from. Uh, I will say that I don't think the the prequels are as bad as most people say they are. I don't think they're mm. great, though they do have my favorite music and my favorite lightsaber fight are in the prequels. Uh, you know, Duel of the Fates and then the Qui-Gon Jinn, Darth Maul, Obi-Wan Kenobi fight is the best lightsaber fight of all the movies. Mm. Yeah, it's the only I do enjoy true that lightsaber one. fight. Like well, to let's just be let's just be honest. In in the originals, Darth Vader's biggest fight was against Obi Wan Kenobi, who was an old man. He had to humor him. You know, he couldn't go faster. It was than an old man Obi-Wan. versus a cripple. Yeah. I mean, that's the general joke about it. And then then it was Darth Vader fighting fighting a dude who's never had a lightsaber training day in his life. He doesn't need to try. Yeah. But it's his son. He needs to make him feel good and encourage him. Yeah. Well, when it comes to the, the originals, uh, basically, as many uh, scholars or teachers of mine have described it, it's it's a cripple, an old man, and a new kid that's never really done this before are your only people fighting. So they're yeah. just fights for people that are really old and really hard to move around and people that are really inexperienced. And then with the prequels, we get to see full-fledged at their prime Jedis going all you know, crazy off the wall. We've been training. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Dooku was at his prime? Okay, aside from Dooku. And Dooku's always at his prime. Christopher Lee can do no wrong. The, my, my, my point is, this, this is all great excuse for the fact that the technology was terrible back when they made those movies and they couldn't get cool lightsaber battles. The, the, the yeah. technology was eh, and they also didn't have the same choreography people, you know. I think the best yeah, is if you watch... The fighting's gotten better since then. If, if you watch the if you watch the behind the scenes of, like, lightsabers and such, they're doing the scene where Luke is slashing at Vader and he cuts his arm off. It's great, and one of the takes, he's just like, bam, bam, and as he swings, his lightsaber blade goes flying off into the backstage, <laughs> and you just hear, kong, 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 and they're just oh, yeah, I mean, looking uh, in the direction. Even if they had the choreographers up today, they wouldn't be able to do it because they'd be shattering all of the stuff which they have no budget for anyway. Yeah, that's true, because the, the lightsabers back then were a lot more delicate, so they could, you know, glow on stage. I mean, yeah, the prequels, yeah, so they, they were the aluminum rod that was painted green, and then they CG'd the color onto it, you know? Yeah. But yep. it's, I mean, they were great. I enjoyed the prequels because it was cooler lightsaber battles. And the only thing I have to say about the prequels, you know, the only thing is they really dropped the ball on the B2 battle droid when you compare it to Republic Commando's version of the B2 battle droid. I know. By the way, Republic the Commando should battle be a movie. Droid. That should be a movie. What? Republic Commando was great. Oh, it should be a movie. It should have been a best. Should, they should have increased the game for more levels after the movies. But yeah. the B2 Battle Royale for this gamers, if you've never played Star Wars Battle Commando, you get scared by it because it's got a much deeper, scarier voice, basically. And the thing's a tank. Yeah. Uh, I hated shooting those things. They would not die. I had to run up and punch one to death a couple of times. Then you get, like, oil all over your face. It's ridiculous. They yep. really pulled out the stops for that game, especially for what it was. It was just, you know, promoing for Episode 3. It is I mean, they the did, best movie time video game I've you ever know, played. One of the things with it is, is the problem is, is, you know, we were given so much freedom with the interpretation of everything that eventually when all this stuff came out, everyone was like, you know, oh, this is a battle droid. This is the Clone Wars. This is how Anakin fell. And then George Lucas comes around and goes, no, actually, this is my vision, my version of how it happened. 
and it doesn't meet the expectations of everybody else, and thus it becomes a disappointment. It's true. It was a lot of hype. Uh, also, I feel that the writing wasn't as crisp, or the directing it wasn't, wasn't as crisp. great. It wasn't solid, but I like again. It was uh, there was a, like, enjoyable sections. Uh, Obi Wan in Episode Two is fantastic until mm. the end. But let's not talk about the end of that movie. The end of that movie I didn't like. So- the way that I describe episodes 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6 is this. If when 4, 5, and 6 were made, it was episodes 1, 2, and 3, it would be awesome. And episodes 4, 5, and 6, if they were made at the same time 1, 2, and 3 was made, in that time frame, it would be the same turnout. It all depends when the movies were made. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, I mean, we expected 4, 5, and 6, so we got 1, 2, and 3. And if it was reversed, we would have expected 1, 2, and 3, and then we would have gotten 4, 5, and 6. If they made 4, 5, and 6 today, and there's no nothing based on brand new, we would have gotten what we could have to 1, 2, and 3. I mean, it's it's just, when you look at it, it's just the way filmmaking has changed since then. And yeah. that's really it. I mean, it's not... They're not what we expected. Like, they're not what we wanted. Sure, they weren't four, five, and six. Just you know, the prequel. But yeah. it was for me. It was Star Wars, and I got my Star Wars fix, and I was happy. Yep. Like we all went and saw Episode One in 3D because you know it's Star Wars. Actually, we get our I now. never got to see it in 3D. I thought you were there with us. No, I wasn't. Oh well, then you missed out. I know. I couldn't make it that day. I was too busy, unfortunately. Yeah, that so, was. And that did a great 3D job with it. It wasn't yeah, I'm sure they did. And it was a lot of just depth perception. Where we were like, "Whoa, I'm in space. I'm getting nauseous." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm not a I'm not a fan of 3D, but I enjoyed that movie in 3D. Uh, I also enjoyed Dread in 3D. Dread in 3D yes. or Dread 3D because that's the title of the movie was yeah. awesome. Yes. And I just got my copy back from one of my uh, coworkers who borrowed it for me for like two months. <laughs> that is an awesome movie if you haven't seen it in 3D then you're missing out it, it you was, missed out because it was fantastic uh, the, the thing is the way they did 3D was so fun because like the, the director was like I want to do 3D but I want to do it in the, the way that no one does it so he's like foreground well, like way too much of a close up on someone's face so you see like the landscape of their face literally and that's even how he describes it and they see stuff in the back and you just you're getting more depth of the well, person and the imagery and it was just it was a nice 3D well, what's nice also about it is, is it executed slow motion very well. That too. The problem with 3D nowadays is, is either the scenes are so fast you can't tell it's in 3D. Or they're too dark. Or they're too dark. Or they do the Resident Evil where they basically pause the stinking movie <laughs> for like 45 seconds for you to see that coin sitting in front of your face because they always have the stupid scene where she fires pennies out of a shotgun, which I still they're, don't they're, get. They're, they're half dollars. She's basically making her own shotgun round. It becomes basically like a, a, a modified slug, like a grape shot. And, gotcha. just, and even even that it's half dollar, I even disbelieve that more because how many half dollars do you see nowadays? Yeah, I would but it's the better. end of the world as we know it, so she's got a good collection because she just went into everybody's house and took it. Yeah, it's not like she's spending them. Yes. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. Off. I'm just saying. It's hard to find half dollars in general. It should have been like quarters or pennies. Well, obviously she broke into a pawn shop and just you know <laughs> broke into their coin case. Hey, That's what you I know why the they, did it, they did it? They did it so they could have. They did it so they could have their money shot. But going back, yeah. oh, funny, funny, haha. <laughs> But going back, oh come on! You know that's what the pun is supposed to be. Is. And you I know did, it. I did. I don't. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but anyways, uh, just that's what they did right with Dread. Going back to it, it was slow mo, so you could see the action, and it was super bright, so you could see the colors. Like they made sure it was bright and slow for like the really big 3D scenes. But then yeah. the subtle 3D was still good because he was playing a lot with perspective a lot in that movie. Like they're like putting people really close or really far away from the camera, so you're getting depth in those non slow mo oh, like, scenes. And like the scenes, like when they're falling, is like beautifully oh, done. That movie, yeah, it was, it was a great violence and beauty movie so that well. failed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did it fail? It did officially, right? It's not, it didn't do well in the office. It didn't do well. Unfortunately, we'll most likely not get a sequel it's out of it. too bad, because it's probably the best action flick I saw all of last year. Ex- aside from Expendables 2. See, I didn't see Expendables 2. So oh, I, you can have say, to I can say Expendables that. Too. <laughs> you have to see I think Expendables those are the only two action movies, like legitimate action movies I've seen that year. Well, no, I think I saw... Um, the Tom, the Cruise one. Tom Cruise does decent movies, but lately I haven't been a fan. Though I will see Oblivion, just mm, because. Yeah. No, well, yeah, I don't plan on seeing Oblivion. I plan on seeing GI Joe and Pacific Rim. Uh, definitely yeah. gonna see GI Joe when I get a chance. It's too bad it comes out this week, so I might not yep. be able to see it, but I want to because uh, it just came out. I want to. 
I want to see that. Uh, I want to see Pacific Rim. I do want to see Oblivion. As far as Tom Cruise goes, I don't hate him, nor am I really a fan of him. I just watched the movie, not to tell you the name, but because I'm interested in the movies that he's in. Yeah. I can care less who he is. So that could have been... Yeah. Anybody. Yeah, Oblivion could have had anybody as the main character and would still when, have the same When it comes to, to, to Tom Cruise, I really like the movies he's in usually. I think he's a pretty solid actor. He always plays pretty much the same role every time, which is whatever, that's fine. He does that role really well. I don't think I'd like him as a person. If I knew him, it's a good thing that I don't know him as a person. <laughs> And what, really now, what if into... what if he's the coolest person to meet ever? If he not, you know, you know, forget Scientology and his craziness and moving it. If he's just an average Joe and you become a friend of his, what if he's like the Messiah of awesomeness? Well, then that makes him even cooler in my book if that were true. But I'm pretty sure that's not going to be true. Well, not at all. But um, let's imagine be, well, you can't be the Messiah of honest, awesomeness and the Messiah of Scientology at the same time. To be I think that's in the honest, rule somewhere. Like. If he ended up, if it is true, and if it, if it were true that he is the the most awesome guy ever that you would ever know in your life, um, not knowing him doesn't affect me in any way, shape, or form, so I still wouldn't care. True. But Fair now, enough. let's be more ridiculous and say once he is, you know, revealed as the Messiah of awesomeness, if you don't know him, your life all of a sudden becomes terrible. Then you have to know him, right? <laughs> exactly. Then you uh, have to go out of your way to know him. Of Awesomeness also just started, and I watched half of it before. I finally watched Ghost Rider uh, Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, okay. Uh, it this was is great. one thing. I kind of like and kind of hate Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. I thought the special effects were a little bit weird in some points. <laughs> like, w- the close-up of his skull where clearly was a puppet. Um... I thought there were just parts of that film that I just couldn't get behind, and par- there was parts of Spirit of Vengeance that I thought Ghost Rider did better, but there are parts of Spirit of Vengeance that I thought they did better than Ghost Rider. I, all See, I here's the thing. Is, I wish they just made this movie and not the other one, because the other one was eh at best. I'm, the other I, one I was didn't... cool until Legion, in my opinion. Uh, the other one didn't have a good solid villain. It didn't have... It, it wasn't I, I, bad. I disagree well, with th- that. Think of Think about it. It, it really you can't say they're solid when people when they're going. Who is this as a villain? You yeah. know they know it's they know it's a Marvel dude, and you bust out these typical adversaries. People go, who are those guys? Because nobody understands what he's fighting. Yeah, that's like, basically no, the they, first yeah, one. They, there's they four didn't... villains that you see for five minutes, and that's like it. And it's like, oh, I guess those were the main bad guys, and they weren't such a big deal because he's Ghost Rider. Hooray! Well, yeah. I mean, but, but I here's the thing with Ghost Rider. Yeah. Ghost Rider. I'm a big fan. I've always been a big fan of Ghost Rider since a kid. And the thing I stand behind with Ghost Rider is it really needs a mature rating to get him done, not properly, but really get everything you want out of him. Because he's a ruthless, relentless mofo. And that is the best way to put him. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't deal with the nice bad guys. <laughs> he, you know, he deals with terrible, terrible things. He deals and with the people that, that do a lot like human better. Traffic. He did a lot, the second movie I think did a lot better because basically Nicolas Cage going crazy the movie and um, everyone loves Nicolas Cage going crazy it's just a fact I don't care what anybody says I enjoy Nicolas Cage as an actor he's one of my one, favorite actors. one thing one thing I will say about Spirit of Vengeance I was glad that the um, that the urinating scene was a kid's imagination and not actually happening yeah but it was, it was funny. pretty funny <laughs> I thought that was to be honest I thought that was unnecessarily stupid I love that because it was just it was just so over the top that I could only thing I could do well, was chuckle at it. Well, like I it, said, it like was. I felt like I felt <laughs> for me like when I saw it in trails, I was like, are they really doing that? But when I found out that it was the kid imagining him doing it, then I was a little bit more okay with it. Yeah, basically, yeah. I thought it was in the movie, and then when I saw it literally just before we started the podcast and it just started again now, uh, I was like. That's pretty funny, and I, I giggled. I definitely got a good I, chuckle giggle going on. For that, that was definitely better, in my opinion, overall, than the first one. The first one has some things I liked better, and the second one has some things that, a lot of things that I liked over the first one. Yeah. Oh, but the I, still, one. I still stand that we haven't seen a true, proper Ghost Rider movie, just because we haven't really got it to be a full-on mature rating. I feel once you get that, you can get some craziness going on, more so than just get out the kids see it then I think it would be a little bit better. But I think Nicolas Cage plays a very good Ghost Rider. He I'll agree with that. I think he does a very good yeah. Johnny Blaze. Uh, I think that the second one is better than the first one. Like, I'm just watching it, and I'm, I'm loving the cinematography. Uh, they get this great action feel. Uh, things oh, yeah. blow up. You have a sense of they... who the, the antagonist yeah. is. You have a sense of what's going exactly. on. 
Like, it's just, uh, I, I don't want to say the first one was mad. The first one was, like, overall, was like, eh, though it looked really cool. This one, though, like, I'm like, this was a Ghost Rider movie. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it was a lot closer to being a real Ghost Rider movie. See, this um, was kind of a, a sequel. If we got a, a complete standalone redo, I think seeing based on what the Trapper did, I think it would be a lot better. You yeah. Know? yeah. Well, I think we've talked enough for now <laughs> in this podcast. Done on four. We've gotten over 20 minutes <laughs> over our normal time. <laughs> yes. So, yes, we have. So... Um, so, yeah, thank you all for listening to us ramble about our stuff. Yes, and I have some questions for you, PS Gamers. Number one, you know, feel free to chime in for everything we talk about here. But I know I know some of you, because I've been comments, you like to have this on while you paint. What were you painting when you were listening to this, and is it done yet? Let us know. Good question. Yes, good question. So, yes, there are, like, said, like you said, there are people out there, if you probably didn't understand... Um, some people have commented that they paint while they listen to this podcast. We're curious, what did you paint, and has it been finished yet? And if it has been finished, what are you painting now? Yeah, uh, and frankly, if you're not painting while watch, listening to us, uh, why not? It's a perfect opportunity to just paint for an hour. Just do it. Yeah, I mean, there could be stuff from the web doing crazy stuff. You never know. But if you are doing something hobby-related, let us know what it is. We're curious, because we want to know. And chances are you probably paint way better than I do. So congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> So that is all for right now. Um, I think, Stark Lord, it's time for you to wrap this up. Okay, well, thank you guys for listening. This has been the Fearless Games Podcast. Y'all come back now, you hear? Take care. Bye. Bye.